everyone, thanks for stopping by. Uh, today's video is going to be a topic video covering my research project. It will explain uh, kind of what I, why I'm in Poland, what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm going to be covering basic uh, sediment transport concepts, how I'll be measuring, uh, how I'll be actually collecting my data, and the information I hope to obtain. Uh, so I hope you enjoy and thanks for stopping by. So the fundamental principle of sediment transport is that in any given body of water, there's, there contains some percentage of solid material in the fluid. These solids can range from biological in nature, such as plant material and uh, leaf litter, to chemical, such as phosphates and nitrates, and the much more common uh, particulate matter, such as uh, sand silt. And even the river rocks, which you see on the banks of creeks, were at some point transported by the by the water column. So at any given point, uh, a body of water is either depositing or transporting sediment. And the quantity uh, of, of solid that any fluid can contain depends upon four factors. So while there is a multitude of factors affecting sediment transport, these four are considered the most common. So the energy of the fluid dictates its ability to transport sediment. And this is apparent when you think about washing your hands under a sink, uh, where a fasting, faster moving water column allows more dirt to be washed off. Uh, you can also think of a pressure washer, where the energy of the fluid allows it to uh, quickly transport away any solids. Uh, this valley here is an example of a high energy system. Rain and, slow flow, rain and snow flow down the slopes of the mountain range uh, and allow the fluid to gain kinetic energy. Uh, its high energy allows it to rapidly erode its surroundings, uh, which eventually results in this valley. A delta, on the other hand, is an example of a low energy environment. As water approaches the coast, it encounters a massive, slow moving body of water and the energy of the fluid drops. As the energy of the fluid drops, it deposits its sediments because it can no longer it no longer has the available energy to transport it, and the result is this fan-like structure off the coast uh, where you can see the sediment has uh, deposited in large quantities. The next factor affecting sediment transport is the size of the sediment being transported. Obviously, it will take a lot more energy to move a boulder than it would a piece of sand. And so only during times of high energy, such as floods or heavy rainstorms, can larger sediment be transported. The composition of the source of the sediment is also important in the transportation of sediment. If you've ever poured water on a granite tabletop, you know that the granite doesn't come off. In fact, the water just uh, moves easily over the surface. Uh, in this picture here, you see granite next to a, a crumbly uh, sandstone. And if you poured water on that sandstone, of course, tiny bits would walk away. And so the density of the of the riverbed and the strength of the material that's being transported also affects how much transport will be broke uh, how much sediment will be broken off the source material and transported downstream. Density plays another role uh, just because if you have a piece of iron the same size as a piece of plastic, uh, the energy required to do that piece the, the piece of iron is much greater than the piece of plastic. So the final factor is the availability of the source material. So if you have a creek outside your house and one day you went and bought a bunch of cement and started pouring cement into the creek, uh, you can say for, for pretty sure that the amount of concrete that that creek is now transporting is much higher than it was before. And so how the land around the source material changes also changes how much sediment is being dumped into the river. Uh, one, one common example is tree roots. Tree roots limit the erosion of sediment into the soil. And so if you destroy the trees and the roots, the availability of the source material is now higher. So now that we understand the factors influencing sediment transport, uh, why is it important to monitor it? Well, if sediment that was being transported is now being deposited, this can result in something called siltation, which is the presence of unwanted sediment. And this has important economic ramifications uh, Structures along rivers such as dams can be uh, clumped in, and blocked and need repair. Riverbanks can fill up, uh, preventing uh, maritime traffic. Uh, 
and the the high fact the high presence of sediment and water results in something called turbidity, which reduces vision and can actually uh, inhibit certain fish from breeding. So, large concentrations of suspended sediment downstream has detrimental effects, but the source of this effect can also be understood by uh, the use and changes of this in the source material. If you've ever worked on a farm, you've probably seen a gully. And a gully is just a valley, a steep valley cut through a farm field uh, where uncontrolled erosion has rapidly deteriorated the surrounding land. Gullies are particularly harmful for agricultural practices because, uh, it's first of all, it's difficult to get a, uh, equipment over it. It's rapidly expanding, so it's always getting bigger. And the acreage that uh, used to be farmable is now completely washed out and unusable. Some of the biggest examples of poor agricultural uh, practices resulting in erosion is probably the Dust Bowl. And a lot of times you think of the giant windstorms. And in this case, the atmosphere, the air, is actually the fluid instead of water. But it's the same, it's the same basic principle. Uh, changes in the source material led to uncontrolled sediment, tra sediment transport. This actually has a link back to my hometown. Uh, the Hoosier National Forest, the majority of it was farmland, um, but after several decades, actually probably several centuries of farming, the soil was completely eroded and unusable, and the topsoil was just sloughing off the hillside at an uncontrolled rate. And so the fix for this was to actually plant the Hoosier National Forest, in which they planted uh, pine trees because they grew fast and their roots would spread quick to help stymie the erosion. So the data that I'm targeting with my project is the suspended sediment concentration, uh, which is just simply a proportion of the amount of solid in the fluid to the, quant to the volume of water. It's usually uh, measured in milligrams per liter, so how many milligrams of sediment per liter of water is being measured. To make the sediment concentration meaningful, however, we also have to know the volume of fluid that's actually being transported. Uh, when we take a suspended sediment concentration sample, we know the proportion of sediment to water, uh, but to really understand the full volume of sediment being transported, uh, we have to have the volume of water being transported. So the volume of water being transported by a stream is called the volume rate of flow. And the volume rate of flow represents the quantity of water transported by a stream in a given period of time. So let's break this down. Pictured we have a cube marked in blue. Uh, this cube has a length, a width, a width, and a depth. And because this object is a cube, all these sides are equal. So let's just call them D. If we multiply these sides to get a volume, the result is D cubed, or D to the third power, uh, which is why we often measure volumes in cubic feet, uh, just as area is measured in squared feet and can, can be represented by a two-dimensional square. So if we return to our equation up top and we break down the volume into d cubed over t, basically what that's t telling us is that this is the number of, of uh, cubes of fluid that the river is transporting in a given period of time. So as you can see, this, is, this equation is somewhat of a problem for us because water doesn't transport itself in perfect cubes. It's a... Uh, erratic and uh, unsteady um, geometric shape as it flows through the, through the creek bed. And so there's no real way for us to measure this. Um, so let's see if we can rearrange this a little bit so that we can actually measure the amount of volume being transported by our creek. In order to remedy our cube situation, let's uh, take a specific cross section of the creek that we want to measure the volumetric rate of flow. In the side view uh, at the top of the page, uh, that's me standing on the bank next to the water, and uh, let's measure the depth and the width of the river. And that will give us the cross-sectional area of that specific point in the river. Um, and we'll call this d squared, d times d. And if we go to our top view on the lower page, we can also measure the velocity of the stream. 
we'll, in this case, we'll use a rubber duck uh, denoted in yellow. And its position at time T1 is the upper position, and its position at time T2 is its, is its uh, position after a certain number of seconds. And so if we measure the distance that this rubber duck travels in the set amount of time, we can determine the velocity of the flow of water. And the velocity units are, again, d divided by t. So now that we have our cross-sectional area and our velocity of the water, let's return to our equation and see what we can do. If we take our newly measured quantities, being velocity and cross-sectional area, and multiply them together, um, velocity being d over t, and cross-sectional area being d squared, uh, our end result is d cubed over t, uh, which happens to be precisely uh, our volumetric flow rate. And so by taking this equation and breaking it down into measurable quantities, we can now accurately tell the number of cubes of fluid being transported by this creek in a given amount of time. So now that we have our, the volumetric rate of flow of our body of water, we can begin to take sediment samples. The sort of sediment sample I'll be using is called a depth integrating sampler. Uh, it's manual, it's not electronic, and there's many different models of these depending on the parameters of the body of water you're measuring. Uh, these parameters are the depth and the velocity of the water. And all the, the thing that these kind of samplers have in common is that they take advantage of the premise that if you keep the velocity of the water constant as it enters the intake nozzle, you also preserve the proportion of sediment to water. Um, therefore, you're not disturbing the concentration of sediment while you're trying to take a sample. Obtaining an ac accurate sample with this sort of sampler is relatively straightforward. You pick the, a vertical of the creek you wish to measure, and at a constant rate, you lower the sample to the base of the river and back to the surface. Uh, if done correctly, it will preserve uh, a proportionality of sediment to water that exists in that particular vertical column of water. But as you can see, we have a problem here. Because I'd, I'm not necessarily concerned with the suspended sediment concentration in the specific vertical, but I'd rather like to know the total, uh, the average suspended sediment uh, concentration across the entire width of the creek. To remedy the situation, we divide up the width of our cross section into equal increments and take a sample from each, uh, each width. By averaging the suspended sediment concentration across all equal widths, we can determine the average suspended sediment concentration in our cross section. So once we take our sediment samples back to the lab, we can evaporate off the remaining fluid and we'll be left with a quantity of sediment measured in milligrams. And by doing this, we obtain our suspended sediment concentration, which is milligrams per liter. If we take the suspended sediment concentration and multiply it by our earlier derived volumetric flow rate, which is measured in liters per day, we can get a quantity called sediment discharge, milligrams, which is the milligrams of sediment per day that is being washed down the river. And so by obtaining the sediment discharge and the suspended sediment concentrations in the uh, tributaries, that concludes my fieldwork portion of my research project, which is going to be about roughly half the work I'm doing over here. The other portion will be collecting land use data um, from local agencies and doing maybe my, some of my own investigations. And the whole idea is that... Uh, by measuring the amount of sediment in the water, you can see how certain land use is affecting the erosion and transport of sediment. Um, you, it can also help predict any future problems. You know, if, if there's like an absolutely insane amount of milligrams of sediment per day being uh, washed down the watershed, it's going to end up somewhere. And uh, Szczecin, my home base, has a lot of channels and uh, docks, which would be directly affected. And in the end, it's why I picked the Odra River to do my study in Poland, uh, because it's a it's it's a expansive river with lots of different types of land use, and so I have lots of different uh, avenues to investigate how land use affects erosion. Um, and there's also some very real consequences here. There's farmers who would suffer from erosion and loss of soil.
uh, as well as uh, the maritime facilities here would suffer as well. So um, hopefully I'll upload some videos of some field work in action, um, some more informative. I had to cover a pretty broad range of topics and I didn't get into anything too specific, uh, but there's some cool things I could show you guys and uh, make sure to tune in. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you guys soon.